All right. Well, thank you everyone for, for coming. Um, we're going to let the virtual participants in. Um, yeah, I'm excited about this. I think this will be a good uh, small group discussion and, and I'm excited to hear everyone's thoughts. So we are joined today by Jessica Smith. She's uh, virtually calling in. Uh, she's from Colorado School of Mines. Um, but first I wanna introduce uh, myself and, and this breakout session, get everyone on the same page. Um, so my name is Marguerite Gear. I'm a program officer here um, on the Board of Earth Sciences and Resources um, uh, and part of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and this breakout session, we're gonna be focusing on uh, social acceptance of mining for the, for the energy transition. Brian, do you wanna advance the slide, please? Thank you. Okay, so I know you saw this in the um, auditorium, but I just wanna reemphasize this. Um, we do have a strong expectations for conduct here because this is gonna be um, partially discussion-based. I do just wanna reemphasize this. Please do show respect to your, to your colleagues um, here and, and, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so to give a little bit of context about this uh, topic, um, this is something that, that I personally have been interested in a long time, um, and I know uh, several of you probably as well. So this is on the social acceptance of mining for the energy transition. Uh, so as probably all of you know, a significant amount of critical minerals will be needed for the energy transition. However, uh, communities near potential mining operations uh, will often have concerns about the potential impacts um, of, of those mining operations. And you know, you hear a lot of folks talking about the social um, license to operate uh, in the industry, but, but nevertheless, many projects are still stalled or canceled um, before they can begin. So the, the question I'm really hoping we can, we can dive into here is how might we ethically source the minerals needed for the energy transition and, and um, engage with communities? And so that my goal for this session is really to help us think about and define the research and policy priorities in this area um, and, and brainstorm the best way that we can advance those ideas. So as I alluded to earlier, our, our uh, key speaker today is Jessica Smith. Uh, Jessica is a professor at the Colorado School of Mines and the director of the Humanitarian Engineering and Science Graduate Programs. Um, so she is an anthropologist and her research focuses around the public accountability um, in engineering with particular focus on the mining and energy industries. So I've heard her present before and I've really enjoyed it. So I'm looking forward to this. Um, so Jessica, you can feel free to take it away um, and, and share your slides. Good morning. Thank you, Margo. I'm really happy to be here and be able to spend this time with you all. Uh, I'm going to start by providing a broader context of mining and, the trans and the energy transition to make sure we're all on the same page before moving through different ways to think about social acceptance and tools that have been developed to try to support it. Um, so I, I think as we all know, um, the energy transition will be one that is minerally intense. Um, so the International Energy Agency here has estimated the mineral load of different future scenarios um, from already existing policies to sustainable development to net zero by 2050. Um, and, and you can see the forecasted boom that would be required to meet these different goals. Um, they already estimate that an electric car, for example, requires six times as many mineral inputs as a conventional one, and that a wind plant requires nine times as many uh, minerals than a conventional gas-fired one. Um, while these projections of mineral demand are for future scenarios, we've already seen um, increased demand. So since 2010, the amount of minerals needed to generate a unit of power has increased by 50%. And in the past five years, demand for lithium has tripled, demand for nickel has increased by 40%, and demand for cobalt has increased by 70%. Um, so to give you a sense of the minerals that would be required um, for this net zero scenario, we would need to mine as much copper in the next 25 years as we have in all of human history. Um, so this raises a few concerns. Um, one of them is geopolitical. Um, so China dominates 
both the production and processing of, of many of these minerals that we need for clean energy. Um, so that raises concerns about the U.S. securing a supply chain of responsible um, partners that, that are ethically sourcing these minerals um, because the risks of cumulative injustice are really severe. Um, so this is a study that comes out of the University of Queensland in which they mapped um, what they call energy transition minerals um, projects, so potential and planned um, mine sites. And what they found was that two thirds of them are located on or adjacent to land that is held or used by indigenous peoples or subsistence farmers. So people who are very land dependent. And of that subset, two thirds of them are situated in places with adverse conditions for human rights compatible permitting, consultation and consent. Um, and that these places are also uh, correlated with a higher occurrence of violent conflict food insecurity and gender inequality. So there's a real risk that in moving forward quickly to meet our uh, the mineral demands of the energy transition, that we'd be reinforcing already existing um, injustices that have already been borne by people who are more vulnerable and marginalized. Um, I think it's also fair to say that the crisis of public acceptance that we see in the mining industry is not unique to mining. Um, so we see protests against planned solar facilities, wind facilities, carbon capture and storage facilities. Um, and so we're, we're living in a moment in which there's not a lot of trust of industry in general or of government. Um, and that kind of the mining industry itself is changing. Um, so oftentimes when, when people who aren't kind of intimately involved in mining think about mining, they think about someone with a pickaxe using hand tools underground. Um, and that isn't true of today's minds, or and it's certainly not true of the minds of the future. Um, so there's uh, kind of the best and brightest thinking about what a, a mine of the future would be. Um, the overall goal is that would be a not net positive impact for stakeholders. Um, a big portion of that is lowering the environmental impacts of mining. Um, so using less water, creating less waste um, by mining differently um, and using less energy and trying to electrify whenever possible. Um, the mine of the future will probably have a very large um, digital dimension to it, including artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, and that will <clears throat> include more autonomous equipment and processes as well. Um, so I think it's important to keep in mind that the mining industry itself is, is changing, and we ought to think about how that affects something like social acceptance. Um, so to move in to think about um, social acceptance, um, it's important, I think, to distinguish between broad public support for a project and tolerance for a project, um, as I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but I think the most important thing is to distinguish kind of social acceptance from something more formal like permitting, in which uh, developers are actually working with appropriate government agencies to receive permits in order to drill um, and to build and to operate. Um, we started thinking about social acceptance because one of the things we learned is that uh, those permits alone are not enough to actually bring a project forward in an ethical way. Um, so by social acceptance, we mean more kind of broad public opinion. And so when I think about different frameworks for thinking about social acceptance, I tend to think of them on a spectrum. Um, so as, as Margot mentioned in the introduction, the main framework that's been used to think about social acceptance has been the social license to operate. Um, so this is a term that originated in the mining industry in the early 2000s, but since has just boomed. And, and you'll find even people in, in biotech doing gene drives talking about a social license to operate. Um, usually the, the practices and programs that are put into place under a social license to operate framework are led by corporations, um, and they tend to be very voluntary in nature. Um, on, on the other side of the spectrum, we can think about ways of assessing and bringing about social accept acceptance that are more legally binding um, and that tend to be led by others um, instead of the developer themselves. So the gold standard here is really free prior and informed consent um, that emerges from human rights law um, and specifically deals with indigenous peoples. Um, and I've been very interested to see in the United States um, an attempt to try to move some of those principles into permitting um, for more mainstream communities. Um, so the Department of Energy has been doing this in their nuclear waste program um, under the guise of what they're calling consent-based siting. Um, so if we start with the social license, since it's the dominant framework, uh, people who use this in a really robust and nuanced way will distinguish levels of a social license. 
Um, so without legitimacy, they will say that there is no license, um, there is no acceptance. If you can establish legitimacy, the first level is acceptance. Um, if you can establish credibility, that would move into approval. Um, and then if you can establish trust, um, that would move into psychological identification. When kind of you have a group of folks not thinking about a project as just being external to them that they're approving or tolerating, um, but something that they're kind of invested in, in terms of their own sense of, of identity. Um, there's a lot that's really good about the social license framing and how popular it's become. Um, so there's a, it signifies a widespread acknowledgement that industry must be responsive to communities rather than simply compliant with permitting. Um, it also places community acceptance squarely inside of a company's material interests because it's often used by people to advocate for more resources for things like meaningful community engagement uh, because there's been arguments and, and studies actually published showing that without um, acceptance, uh, there's a high risk of projects being stopped, projects being kind of held up um, so that there's a material impact on a company's financial bottom line. Um, however, at the same time, as, as I've written about and as others have written about, um, social license is not the silver bullet that some people treat it as. And, and I will frame this kind of slide by explaining that, of course, there are differences among companies. And there are some companies that can use social license in a very meaningful way. Um, and there are other companies that kind of use it to um, just do maybe the bare minimum that's necessary to have a project move forward. Um, one of the main criticisms of the social license framing is it can privilege perceptions and appearances over outcomes and impact because it really frames the problem to be what do people think about us, not what are we doing. Um, and, and because the focus is on public perception and discourse, it can focus on squeaky wheels, um, so people who are very loud and take up a lot of space. Um, and it can also be easy to mistake silence for acceptance. Um, so a lack of protest and a lack of complaint doesn't mean that people accept your project. They may not feel safe saying that out loud. Um, it's also very clear that acceptance changes over time. It's it's not like a regular permit where you get it um, and, and you have it. It's, it's much more ephemeral. Um, and I think from my time doing research with people in industry, one of my main concerns is that the social license framework um, has been used to treat communities as risks, that they are a risk because they might shut down a project. Um, and so we need to make sure that they're okay. And while there is an element of that that needs to happen in projects, treating people as risks is rarely conducive to building the kinds of sustained partnerships that you would need for sustainable development. Um, and lastly, that social license in its kind of very voluntary form doesn't substitute for other forms of governance and engagement, um, such as FPIC. So if we go back kind of to this other side of the spectrum. Um, this concept really emerges from international human rights law um, and the United Nations. By free, they mean there is no manipulation or coercion, um, and crucially that the project is self-directed by those affected by it um, rather than by the developer. Um, prior means you have enough time to actually engage in this process um, before a project is set to be started or authorized. Um, informed means that people receive satisfactory information on the key points of the project, its scope and duration. Um, but the kicker here is that consent itself is actually not defined. Um, and this is because there's a respect for indigenous people to have self-autonomy and self-determination of what consent looks like. And so what the UN will note is that it should determine on, uh, autonomously how they define and establish consent kind of for themselves because that varies. Um, as you can imagine, um, while this is an aspirational goal, there are lots of challenges involved in actually implementing this. Um, so the first is that consent requires being able to say no to a project. Otherwise, the more accurate term to call this is consultation, which is very different. Um, it is also true that consent does not equal consensus um, for most folks, but it's very unclear how much is enough. And this becomes very um, concerning uh, because communities aren't homogenous and internal power differences can make processes unjust. So if you have a group of folks, um, a, a group of indigenous people who have a particular political process, it, it itself could marginalize people inside of that community. Um, there's also a very thorny question about how much information and knowledge is enough to be informed. 
especially when you consider that we're working across multiple languages, that people have different backgrounds, um, different concerns, and different judgments of acceptable risk um, than, might, than might come out of environmental um, consulting firms that are usually the ones doing these pre-studies. Um, so if we think about what this might look like kind of for populations more broadly um, rather than, than just indigenous people, um, I've been following closely what the DOE is doing in their Office of Nuclear Energy um, and specifically their move to consent-based siting. Um, so their vision is one in which communities determine whether and how a nuclear waste facility aligns with their goals, needs, and concerns. Um, and they're agnostic about what a successful outcome is, that it could be a negotiated agreement, but it could also be a determination not to proceed as a way of respecting that right to say no, as I was just referring to. Um, and while nuclear waste is, is different from mining, I think there are a lot of parallels that we could learn from. Um, when you look at the values that they've committed to instilling in their consent-based siting process, you'll see that many of them correspond with FPIC, um, as well as some principles from environmental justice movement. Um, so kind of with that kind of way of thinking about social acceptance, I, I think the next really pressing question is to think about how could we actually go about trying to build it? Um, and kind of the, the main lesson that I'll be underlining kind of throughout most of these tools is that it really is more successful and more meaningful when you move engagement earlier in the process of planning and design. Otherwise, when you leave it to the end, it becomes more of an exercise in public relations instead of actually creating a project that is socially acceptable. Um, and, and I think the first thing is to be honest about what we mean by engagement. Engagement is one of those really squishy words that you can have people use and mean almost opposite things. Um, so an engagement has become kind of this nice word that everybody says that they're doing, but in very different ways. Um, so this is a chart that the EPA will also use in some of their public facing um, presentations in which you can think about um, consent, uh, you can think about engagement all the way from kind of the very minimal in terms of just giving people information um, to the middle in which you are expressing appreciation kind of for what they say and taking in input and acting on the input um, all the way to the more meaningful side, according to community-based organizations, in which there would be more power for communities to actually shape um, a project and perhaps even have ownership over it. So I think being clear about what we mean by engagement is really crucial to this whole discussion. Um, so, and moving kind of to integrating meaningful feedback earlier into the process um, can feel really risky for developers. Um, because the, the dominant practice is one in which kind of you design a project and then once you have everything kind of all the way best, according to how you're defining best, then you share it with people and, and try to share enough information to try to gain acceptance for a project. So that's very late in the process. Um, it is much more meaningful if you can move that up into the planning phase so that the shape of the project itself would actually change based on what you're learning through the engagement practices. Um, so these are the tools that I'm going to be talking about. Um, the, the benefit agreements that I have on the right there can be used in the planning process and probably are better used in the planning process, but they can also be used relatively late, which is why I've kind of separated these out. Um, my, my favorite example of, of doing meaningful engagement that, that helps to create projects that are socially acceptable um, is co-design. And, and co-design is a process in which developers actually sit down with people who are affected by a project to try to design the project together. Um, and my favorite example that, that I've written about and spoken about a lot is the Henderson Molybdenum Mine here in Colorado. This was planned and permitted back in the 1960s and 1970s in the midst of a very strong and growing environmental movement. Um, what AMAX was the, the company that opened that mine. What they did was they invited ecologists um, and local government and local folks to sit down and actually design that mine together. Um, and that process of co-design resulted in material changes to that project um, and that project you know, is, is still is still going today. Um, it's been interesting to see 
other minds um, pick up this practice recently, especially um, as the crisis of social acceptance has really grown in importance. Um, so for example, Rio Tinto and their efforts to improve their relationships with Aboriginal people in Western Australia, um, their new Western Range project, which is uh, an iron ore mine, has been completely grounded in, in co-design. Um, and, and that project is, is moving forward and, and looks like it could be successful in the end. Um, so co-design is really kind of the most robust way to think about integrating feedback into a project, but it takes a lot of time and trust. Um, I've also been really interested, um, the wind industry has been doing some things that I, that I think um, are, are helpful for thinking about. Um, so this is an example from a landscape symposium. Um, in which they hired a graphic artist to create images of potential future layouts um, for a wind farm actually in southern Wyoming. Um, and, and what they did was they shared these with, with local people and, and got feedback so they could try to distill some of the preferences um, and patterns in those preferences as they were designing a future facility. And I think with advances in virtual reality, I've heard lots of folks in industry talking about being able to actually show potential host communities what a mine site could look like um, in order to be able to empower them to ask um, more specific questions and, and to provide better answers and to actually have concrete discussions about kind of what, what can be changed and, and what can't. Um, if we move into the realm of negotiated agreements, um, what, what characterizes these is that they're legally binding. Um, and, and they're assigned between companies and either environmental groups um, or indigenous populations. So the, the mining industry has been doing these for a long time um, before kind of this move to community benefit agreements. So the good neighbor agreement that really stands out as being kind of the, the first of its kind and, and very successful is the one in Stillwater, Montana. Um, I've also spent a lot of time studying the one for the Buckhorn Mine in Washington. And what both of those good neighbor agreements did was they set higher environmental standards than were currently required by state and federal law. Um, and they also provided a way for the environmental groups that were party to these agreements to participate in the operation of the mine um, so that they would be able to receive information and provide feedback when there needed to be a change in plans. Um, impact benefit agreements are more specific um, and these have been signed between mining companies and indigenous peoples, primarily in Canada and Australia. Um, and the person who has really spent his career studying these is Ofer Chalet. And so I have one, one reference for one of his more recent works below, but I'd encourage you to look at his whole body of work. Uh, what these IBAs do is ensure that a share of economic benefits are directed toward affected indigenous peoples. We can think about economic benefits as financial gains, employment, and business opportunities. Um, and there've been studies showing kind of the, the positive impacts of those. Um, they also create stipulations for reducing negative um, environmental impacts through greater environmental protection, um, including a greater role for indigenous peoples to define, identify and protect cultural heritage as well as environmental um, resources. Um, and then lastly, kind of there, there's some speculation that these could be used to fill in the gaps of follow-up monitoring um, if there would be kind of more formal state involvement. Um, and so lastly, I, I wanted to touch on community benefit agreements um, since these have been embedded into kind of the projects that are being funded through our infrastructure funding. And there's a really wonderful resource that I wanted to highlight and that's the National Academies workshop on leveraging community benefit frameworks, which you can watch online, it's, it's two days. Um, my takeaways um, from, from that workshop were the following. And the first is that the gold standard are negotiated enforceable agreements with stakeholders. Um, there were a large number of representatives from community-based organizations there at the workshop. And one of their main critiques is that these are being written by companies without sufficient engagement and buy-in from the people that they're actually trying to benefit. There's also a sense of secrecy um, that sometimes these are not being made public um, and so there was a call for these to be done when a project was actually being conceptualized rather than after the fact. Um, and that in order to involve local people in a meaningful way, you need to provide resources and capacity building to participate in planning. Um, and that that planning would be less burdensome if instead of assembling a group of people, every time there was a project proposal, 
kind of if there was a standing group of people who could engage in long-term regional planning that then could be adapted based on the project instead mm -hmm. of having to reinvent it every time a developer comes. Um, and then lastly, as we mentioned before, um, consent does not equal consensus and there will always be project opponents. Um, so there's a, a big need as kind of developers are thinking about setting up a process to create a community benefit agreement to make sure that it's a representative group of people that you're working with and that they have legitimacy and credibility um, from the wider community that they're representing. Um, so with that, I will say thank you um, and look forward to the discussion. All right, thank you, Jessica. I really, really appreciated that talk. It was great. So I want this to be interactive as much as possible. So um, we're going to try some things out here. Um, we're gonna move into small group discussion, but before we do that, we, we put up a poll. I'm hoping you all can scan that tiny little QR code there maybe <laughs> um, and get to that on your phone um, and vote if you would like, and we'll leave that up there. Um, so that we all can see the, the results. I've also posted it in the, the Zoom chat, so online folks can click on that and vote. And so my hope here is that it'll start you thinking um, and, and lead to some, some good ideas for the, for the small group discussions. Um, so I'll, I'll let you all do that for a little bit. Um, but then I would also encourage you, um, you know, I think we've got three or four good tables here. So um, I'm at each of your tables for, the, for our in-person folks, uh, we have one moderator who's going to be sort of proposing questions to you all and taking notes and reporting out at the end. Um, but I would encourage you all to, you know, introduce yourselves first, get to know the, the other folks at your table, and just think of this as a learning opportunity. Um, I think, you know, not all of us are experts in this field, but I'm, I'm hoping we can come up with some good ideas together. Um, and for the online folks, what we're going to do now and what I'm going to ask Brian to do um, is we're going to let you all feel free to unmute yourselves. Laura Ellis is online and is going to lead your discussion. Um, so we won't put you in your own breakout room, but we will turn down the volume in the room so that you all can, can talk amongst yourself um, and, and Laura will lead that discussion. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to the individual moderators. And Laura, if you could give us just like two seconds to, to make sure the audio is good. So thank you, Jessica, again, and, and um, hopefully uh, you enjoy these discussions. allowed to talk in these um, sessions now? Is that all right? Um, Jessica, thanks so much for your talk. That was really interesting. Appreciate it a lot. Um, my name is Alia. I'm the Center for American Progress. Um, I was really curious about something you said like near the end about the sort of regional um, community groups that are being built. So you don't have to do that ad hoc for every single project. Um, do you have examples of how that's been done properly? Like how do you go about creating like a representative community group um, and like compensating people for that time? That's a great question. Uh, I'm getting a lot of room noise, but I, I can look up, there's a really, really good effort being made in Appalachia to do this. And the name of the organization is escaping me at this point, but look it up quickly and, and give it to you. Um, I, I think <laughs> um, the, the other group to look at is the uh, center. They've provided evidence on this. Um, things that we've been trying to do in some of our work. 
I'm currently part of a project that's working on a carbon capture and utilization and storage project in Southern Colorado. And we're trying to use existing organizations. Um, so Colorado has a state environmental justice board um, that also has local representatives. And then we're trying to get good representatives from different community groups and labor groups, as well as just some citizens at large. But let me find, let me find the name of that group in Appalachia. I appreciate it. Thanks. And then the second one that you said was something center, but I think, there, yeah, again, room noise got in the way. I'll put a link in there too. Okay, thank you. Hi to everybody online. We're just waiting for the room noise to be muted so that we can all hear each other. At least for me, the room noise is still a little bit in the background, but I can hear Jessica pretty well. And I hope that the rest of you can as well. We wanted to take this opportunity while we have Jessica to ourselves to ask additional questions. And um, there are about 35 people virtual. So um, maybe what we could do is if you want to ask a question, uh, raise your hand. And hopefully I'll be able to keep track of those. And we could spend about five minutes with the Q&A for Jessica. Yeah, that sounds great. OK. So uh, JT, his hand is raised. Go ahead, ask your question for Jessica. And I do apologize for the background noise. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, JT calling in from Minnesota. And uh, the community benefit agreement idea has come up in relation to uh, a proposal that's underway with Rio Tinto. It's called the Talon Mine Proposal. Um, and my organization has been involved in considering that idea. And one of the, I think the big question is like, who is the community in this agreement? Who, who's the counterparty to the, to the company? Um, I've not yet heard anyone actually suggest an answer to that. So I'm, I'm curious what your, what your thoughts are on that. It's a really interesting project. Um, so the historically, the good neighbor agreements were signed with environmental organizations that were kind of comprised of kind of local people. Um, they're, one of one of the big critiques of that is that it didn't include local government, um, and so they weren't completely representative. And it left and and it's just it it's a it's more of an uneven playing field when you have kind of an environmental group trying to sign something with a major transnational mining company. So I think there's been a lot of call for actual local government to be counterparties to these things. Um, but but understanding, of course, especially in Minnesota, you also have um, indigenous people who have taken a very strong interest in that project um, and who may not be represented by by the local government structures. But but I think the question of defining who the community is is a really crucial one. Thank you. Um, can we have Barbara Watts from Rhode Island? Uh, yeah, thank you. I am um, at the University of Rhode Island associated with offshore wind projects. And um, the first ones that have gone in uh, seem to have gone in before people knew about them. And so it's, um, it's a perfect example. We have all kinds of community groups now who are against them. Um, I but going forward, BOEM seems to be uh, operating differently, I hope. I wondered what you had heard um, about them, <laughs> about offshore wind, if, if you know anything about it. Uh, is is my colleague Katie Johnson in this room? Um, she's a wind expert. Oh, she has left. Uh, oh. <laughs> she knows more than I do. Um, I the, the same, it's been interesting to me to see, to see the same critiques that have been leveraged against mining and oil and gas in particular um, apply to wind energy in terms of not 
making transparent development plans um, and not providing sufficient time to actually go through this pro process. So I'm, I'm not a wind energy expert, but I, I see similar conflicts. Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to remind everyone here in this virtual space that I've put in the chat function a link to a Jamboard, which has three questions that you can scroll between and you can add comments on any of the yellow sticky notes. Uh, feel free to do that as we are having uh, Jessica address your questions. Shouldn't be too difficult for you to kind of go back and forth. All right, next on our list um, for Jessica is, uh, I hope I pronounced this, uh, Kay Baranek. Go yeah, ahead. Hello there. I realize I don't have my first name up, but my name is Kasha from Chicago. And I know we're speaking mostly on a direct community scale of, you know, what these programs or projects might be directly involving locally. However, in terms of international supply chain, and when we think of local U.S. responses to uh, current mining practices abroad and how that impacts uh, the current social landscape of programs going on here. I just wonder if you have any insight on that and those relations. In terms of how things we do here might make the sourcing of some of these materials more responsible elsewhere? Yeah, I think that's a better framing. <laughs> um, oof. I, I've been really interested. There's a group of scholars at University of California at Davis that has done some interesting work. Um, they have a report that's actually called More Mobility, Less Mining. Um, and, and one of the reasons I appreciate it, and I can put a link in here, is that I, I think it's clear that an energy transition will require a lot more minerals but there's a lot of assumptions built into a lot of those models, for example, that every household needs an EV instead of thinking about building out public transportation. And so what I appreciate about that report is opening up the question about what would we need to change about our own infrastructure in order to reduce the number of minerals that we would need in the long run. Yeah, I think that thank makes you. sense. And in general, examining extractive economies. So thank you. Thanks, Jessica. And thank you for asking that question, Kasha. I was thinking the same thing after seeing that alarming map of the of the world in one of your first slides where it indicated that most of this mining is going to be coming from outside the United States. Next on our list to ask a question of Jessica is Bradley Lusk. Hey, my name is Brad. I'm calling in from Washington, D.C. Um, I'm kind of curious about um, what intervention strategies seem to gain traction during the, you know, consent process when it comes to mining? And then um, second to that is in terms of informed consent, uh, where is it that these communities are kind of sourcing um, or, or getting uh, an understanding of what tools are in their toolbox to use when building out uh, these mines? Those are great questions. I'll start with the the second one. Um, so one of the things that, that has been really clear in looking at kind of attempts to permit new mines is that community groups have become very savvy in, in terms of reaching out to each other. Um, so for example, to go back to the last question about Talon in Minnesota, um, you can reach out to other um, communities that have operations that um, are being run by Rio Tinto um, and to understand more about kind of how how the company works. Um, there have also there are also some, I think, broad sources of support um, that are available publicly um, in, in in terms of learning about something like FPIC. Um, so, so Oxfam and the United Nations, they've created a lot of guidebooks um, that I, I think that there's a there's a barrier to them. And in terms of literacy, I've also seen some really interesting um, illustrated kind of materials that have been created to try to communicate the same information in a more visual format. Um, so I think there are really strong transnational networks of community-based organizations 
that have been successful kind of once communities get linked up with them. But I, I think one of the the main problems, and you can go back, I, one of one of the mining projects that that was an early test of of, of consent, and there was an actual referendum um, in in Peru is the Tambo Grande mine. One of the big critiques of that process is that they brought in I forget how many tons of just printed off environmental impact studies and, and expected people to read thousands of pieces of paper, you know, and, and that was not successful. Thank you, Brad. Our next question comes from Megan O'Rourke. Hi, thank you, Jessica. This is a really great presentation. Um, I come from USDA. This area is sort of new for me and I'm coming from my personal perspective um, and life in which there seems to be a political divide over this. And I, I get people who ask me just like, well, this whole clean energy trans transition is going to be just as bad or worse for the environment. Look at all this mining that we have to do. And I, I don't feel informed enough to have a great answer for that. But I would just wonder, like, do you encounter that? What kind of answer do you give? And like, do you have any go-to references that you, you share to kind of help spread accurate information? Um, that's such a good question. And I, I think the politicization of this issue is is real and I think concerning. And and I and I think it for me and 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 I, I didn't include this in my own intro. So I, I come from a mining region in, in northeastern Wyoming. I, I went to McAllister College Liberal Arts School very politically different from where, where I'm from. Um, and one of the things that, that has struck me kind of moving into academia from, from coming from a, a mining community is that people who are not directly involved in the production of materials or even in the conversion of those materials into, into energy, um, they, they have the privilege of, of not having to know about it um and kind of export the problem elsewhere and i think that's a more general problem with our our energy system is that we have people using energy that don't need to see experience or contemplate kind of what it takes to actually produce the energy um and so the the report that i linked in in the chat i think is a good one um, in terms of providing an alternate perspective on on how many materials we would need. Um, the the graphic that I showed of of the bar charts um, that's the International Energy Agency. Um, I I think that that tends to be kind of less polarized. Um, although you will have community groups that kind of contest some of the assumptions built into some of those as, as I've explained before. Thanks, Megan, that's a tough question. Um, our next question comes from Sean Anderson. Hey, thanks for a great presentation. Um, my uh, question or just more of a, co or, or interest in your comments are a little bit different, I think, than most of um, our colleagues here. Um, so one of the things I work on is deep sea mining Wow. And, um, and, you know, so, so, I mean, while, while there's benefits via the Convention of the Law of the Sea and stuff to various uh, communities, small island nations, et cetera, there's no real immediate community, you know, adjacent or being impacted. But there's been a huge challenge in the last couple of years in terms of the rhetoric where we've even had some environmental groups um, board some of the scientific mining vessels that are trying to do impact assessment and shut down some of the impact assessment. And so it's the rhetoric has become um, a, a quite strange. So it, it's, well, while most of our discussions today have been about how do we have more equity? How do we have more engagement? Um, the, the sort of global rhetoric is, is, um, is, is, is strange uh, to me <laughs> in terms of, it's, it seems similar in some cases to like the tobacco industry and some of the oil and gas industry in terms of the, the techniques to sort of avoid um sort of you know open discussion of data and stuff but i was just curious if you um have had any experience with deep sea mining and that type of stuff yeah well i want to echo your read i think one of the things that's been really clear is that 
the mining industry is using kind of the clean energy transition as a way of trying to reset its relationship um, and, and, and try to create the case for mining and for people to appreciate mining. And one of the things that, that I find striking and that I always share when I'm presenting to industry groups is that the mining industry has been trying to get people to appreciate how much they need mining for the last 100 years, and it hasn't moved the needle in, in terms of public perception. So I'm, I'm not sure that convincing people that we need mining for energy is going to solve many of those problems. Sure. Um, and and so for me, I think where where I where I try to look is when are there projects that are really making material changes in how they are designing engagement and how they're designing the project itself. Um, one of the critiques that came out of that um, academy's workshop on community benefit agreements is that these can be done in a way to manufacture consent rather than really create equity. And, and so I think that is a concern that is that extends beyond mining, really. And I don't have particular domain expertise in, in deep sea mining. I, I do enjoy the debates that happen on the eco minerals listserv, if you're not a part of that. Um, cool. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. Great question, Sean. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mark Fischetti. Uh, hi, uh, thanks, Jessica. Um, apologies for leaving my video off. We have another person in the same room to me in different video conference. <laughs> so we're not going to push our luck. Um, just as quick, early on, you showed a slide of smart minds of the future. I just wondered, there's a lot on there. I wonder if there are any places that are actually implementing a number of those things, new minds or minds that are being reopened, for example. Yeah, um, I just got back from Western Australia, where I was visiting some of the iron ore mines there. And huh. they have been working on automation for a long time, um, because there are not kind of quote unquote mining communities that are adjacent to most of these sites. Right. Uh, they're kind of fly in fly out operations. Um, I There's also a new mining project happening kind of on the U.S., Mexico border, that's going to be the first one that goes through um, that the US has a new permitting structure kind of to hasten permitting for for projects of critical national importance. Um, and, and they're developing a, a lot of new techniques, I can put another um, link in the chat to them. But so so a lot of this is happening, kind of on a company by by company basis. Um, but but they are starting to roll out some of these things. Yeah, that's great. Examples would be great. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. The next question comes from Alia uh, Hidia. It might be Alia. Um, yes. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Um, one additional question, sort of building off of that and thinking about permitting um, regimes and sort of what the federal and state governments can do to support like um, widening of these practices. Um, do you see, think that there's anything that you would recommend to federal or state policymakers right now about either like requiring CBAs or certain processes for mines rather than having it, because it seems right now like it's largely on a voluntary basis. Uh, yeah, just curious to see what policy recommendations you'd have there. Yes, and, and I will out myself as not being a policy expert. Um, but one, one of the reasons I like to show that spectrum is because I, I get very concerned when things are all on a voluntary basis and kind of people are treated as stakeholders rather than citizens. And, and so I think not just requiring CBAs, but requiring particular kinds of processes for negotiating those and making sure that they're being signed by legitimate parties instead of kind of groups that are stood up and and kind of friendly to a project um, would, would be extremely important. And I think making them public, I think would go a long way as well. Thank you. I just want uh, for the people online, just a quick reminder that we actually are hoping you can do two things. One is to vote in our Slido poll it's just a single one page poll where you rank different questions. I know some of you have done that already, but not everybody might have seen it. And then also we have a Jamboard where we're asking you to consider three other questions and just write your thoughts on little yellow sticky notes. Both of the links are in the chat. 
Okay, we have another question from, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, um, Ken Zhang from Queens. Hi, Jessica. Uh, I'm Ken from Queens Mining Department in Canada. Um, I have a quick question to you. You mentioned that consent uh, doesn't mean consensus, and it's challenging to assess like the, how much consent we need. Could you elaborate more on this? I think it's a very important question. Thank you. It is, and hello to a fellow mining school. Uh, <laughs> uh, so consensus would suggest that everyone has come to the same agreement um, and, and that there is, for example, a decision to move forward that everyone who's involved in the process would need to approve that decision to move forward. Um, I, I know that there are indigenous populations that work with that definition of consent um, and, and that there would need to be a process of establishing consensus. Um, when you look at some of the legal debates that have happened and, and guidance that has come out, um, they will not establish consensus as being required for establishing consent. Um, and there, there's no clear statement that it needs to be a simple majority or an absolute majority, um, but that the group of people themselves need to decide what consent would look like and how much would be required. There isn't kind of a, a universal definition because out of deference to kind of self-determination and autonomy. Uh, sorry, a, a quick update question. You, you, you touch about that a community kind of benefit agreement. Uh, do you see that could be a useful tool to kind of promote consensus uh, or, or the more kind of informed consent? Yeah, and I think to go back to um, the, the previous question, I, I think there's a concern that the counterparties to the community benefit agreements wouldn't be representative. Um, and, and so you would want to set up the negotiating party in a way that it's legitimate and credible and representative of the people that they're proposing to speak on behalf of. Um, I've seen other projects where they they kind of stand up a, a, an organization or, for example, um, especially in rural areas, they have rural development groups and those tend to be very pro-industry. And so if you were to sign a community benefits agreement just with a pro-industry group, um, it wouldn't be effective for trying to establish consent. Yeah, thank you. Uh, wonderful. I'm, I'm going to ask my question, Jessica, if that's OK. Of course. Uh, so I, I was just struck by your map in the beginning of your presentation showing all the blue regions as being you know, Ameri North America, Western Europe, Australia which is where you predict that mining will not need to be occurring. Um, and those are also many of the countries that are the largest greenhouse gas emitters. Uh, so I guess with the exception of China, which is both a large greenhouse gas emitter, but also uh, has mining potential. Do you feel like that kind of dichotomy is going to play out in any particular way? Uh, like, can we in America kind of not think about um societal issues because the mining is not happening in our backyard or should we think about it even more because yet again we are imposing our lifestyle constraints and you know we, we've made these choices on a first world living that now yet again affects third world countries disproportionately so I just wondered about your thoughts on that. Well yeah and I think if we go back to our colleague from Minnesota um, there has been a push to try to re-domesticate the mining industry in the United States um, and, and the companies proposing to open new mines. Um, Minnesota is currently debating at least two of them um, are, are precisely using the argument that it is better to produce minerals responsibly in Minnesota and employ Minnesotan people than to outsource our problems elsewhere. Um, and so the I, I think if you were to look at the mineral demands for these different scenarios, the US alone would not be able to meet them. So it would require mining in, in other places. And, and so I think there's also a question of what the US could do to ensure that 
the process of actually planning and permitting those would be done more responsibly um, instead of it. What happens a lot of times when, when mines are being opened in places in the global South, because um, the, the more powerful actors tend to be the corporations. They tend to dominate that process. And there isn't really a nice counterweight of, of a state. Thank you. We do have one more question from Patrick Schroff. Uh, hi, Jessica. Thank you very much. Really intriguing uh, uh, presentation. This is another voice from Minnesota. I'm from the National Hello. Research Institute. <laughs> uh, so just uh, kind of tagging on to uh, JT's uh, conversation before, we, we have a very robust iron mining culture, and then we have many, uh, you mentioned two uh, potential uh, copper, nickel, and critical minerals mines. We have uh, many, many on the books, which is the root of my question. So a typical mining uh, uh, life cycle starts maybe 20 years before the mine actually opens and then 10 to 20 years after it opens. Say you, and I really like the idea that you presented earlier about uh, co-design and this sort of approach. Um, as if mining companies are willing to uh, engage in com with communities early on and they get that consent in those early stages, how how do you deal with consent uh, over time and in the you know in that 20 year gap when the mining actually starts? That's a great question. And I should out myself. So I went to McAllister for my undergrad and my my mom's family is all from Minnesota, which is why I have a Special, special place for that state in my heart. Um, the, the question of how you actually do co-design and, and especially given how long it takes to do is, is a really, really important one. And, and I will, I will give you two different examples. So the Henderson mine, um, happened before NEPA was passed. And so, I think one of the reasons why that project was successful is because they didn't have to grapple with formal state procedures for public participation. And they were able to put together kind of this ad hoc committee and, and make it happen um, in a way that was meaningful. Um, they then, AMAX then tried to get permits for another large molybdenum mine in southwestern Colorado near Crested Butte, if you have been there and enjoyed it. Um, and that was happening in the mid 1970s after NEPA had been passed. And so what they did was, was they were staring down having to do, I forget how many different environmental impact studies. They created a streamlined process in which they would have kind of one permit that they were applying for with one public participation process that would then be respected by multiple different agencies. Um, but that was also a, a time intensive process. Um, in the end, they received their permit. They never built the mine because the mineral market collapsed in the early 1980s, uh, the same year that they received kind of their permit. Um, and so I think one of the things that that I think about is how much resources that takes and how it makes it easier for a company, for example, like Rio Tinto to do um, rather than a junior mining company because they can't kind of float the money that it would take to support that process over such a long period of time. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, great. And uh, JT has his hand raised one more time. JT? Thanks. And I, I... Thanks, Laura. I appreciate that. I see we are out of time, though, too. So I don't know. I, I wanted to just follow up on this this idea um, that you raised about you know concern for mining impacts in, in the global south and how should we be thinking about that in Minnesota, where we also have minerals. And you know, it's obviously like to the extent that it causes us to consider our consumption, I think it's to the good. We are also very concerned that it's being used in a more cynical way to kind of blunt local defense of like resources, which impacts not just communities here, but communities all over the world. So that's a concerning dynamic in the conversation. And I think it's ultimately a mining industry frame that skips a lot of other options that Jessica alluded to, like you know, diverting minerals from other uses or reducing consumption overall or substituting technologies. Like 
it kind of skips all those really important options. And this is something we worry about a lot in Minnesota. So I just, I, <laughs> thank you for giving me a, a moment to just kind of toss that in here at the end. Oh, that's no problem, JT. Thank you for participating. We are out of time, but until they turn the room sound back on and bombard our microphones with their chatter, um, I just wanted to once again, draw people's attention to the Slido poll that we have going, um, just so people know, we had asked a question about highest priority science and policy issues, and people have been ranking them um, one through five. Uh, if you haven't gone over to that poll, uh, go ahead. And then also we have a Jamboard open where many of you now have been writing comments. Um, uh, the three things we asked you are, are there other science policy questions not included in those five that you think uh, we should be talking about? Uh, what are your reactions to the poll? Some of you were surprised uh, in various ways. And then finally, um, if you could think about a National Academies activity that would focus on some of the top priority questions, what format do you think might be useful? That's one of the goals of this exercise is to try to figure out how the National Academies can be useful in advancing um, some of the concerns that Jessica has already talked about. So if you haven't had a chance to vote in the Slido or to make a comment in the Jamboard, please go ahead and do that. And then I've just found out we will be rejoining the room um, in one minute. Uh, last chance to have a okay. question answered. Oh, sorry, sorry to cut in. Can, can folks hear me? Okay. Um, so thank you all for discussing. That was that was great. I enjoyed that, that discussion. Um, we uh, can kind of informally have some report backs now um, before we send you all off to lunch. Um, so maybe if I could ask Kasha and Charles and, and Miles and, and Laura to just give really, really short one minute report backs on, on what you talked about. If there were any particularly interesting comments you, you'd like to bring out, those are welcome as well. Um, let's see, who wants to start? <laughs> Kasha, do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, so I can try. We, we had a, a, a great conversation that touched on so many different things and it's a little bit stream of consciousness, but um, I think that one of the last things that we touched on was the importance of um, dress tops, organizations that um, ways to distribute federal funding um, at the subnational level and at the community level that um, are fair and equitable because oftentimes the appropriation of the funds kind of you know throws a wrench into all of the all of the good intentions that uh, we may have. We also talked a lot about trust in communities that already have mining projects and how different mining projects are across the board and uh, what you're mining for. Um, we, talked a lot, uh, we talked a lot about the um, oil and gas industry and the coal industry and how those differ from precious metal and mineral mining industries and all those are all um, Distracted, they all have um, they have different pro pros and cons. That's the wrong word, um, but um, <laughs> cons, cons, cons. <laughs> but they have different levels of community acceptance um, and and trust. So I think. Um, And uh, the online audience is okay with it. And I'm just, just going to uh, go through a couple of highlights from our discussion. Uh, so, yeah, we talked about a lot of different things, great ideas, you know, um, a lot of questions came up, more questions than answered, of course, but you know, why aren't there already those things? So it's based on other. Yeah, uh, or it's in the past. Uh, question: you know, How do we evolve 
communities, the community of engagement, and accessing these community based community knowledge. Um, how do we improve education in this? It's the top, um, the single top choice there was education related and understanding risks, um, risks and benefits, the trade offs there. Um, you know, understanding the trade offs between kind of the local scale versus the large scale when it comes to climate change. It's this kind of thing that we discussed. Uh, let's see, we also discussed a couple of ideas for potential um, for our other uh, activities. And that's that if, um, bring the first groups together to uh, address multiple questions, all these questions in our whole uh, community, community expertise. Um, and the uh, idea was to have kind of an ask an expert workshop where um, you could have a really engaging workshop where people could come with questions. It seems there's a lot of questions in this space. Um, other idea uh, how scientists can contribute to some of these examples of Henderson logic, for example, for that logic and show how scientists can contribute. Um, and I'll just finally say uh, another idea was a repository for all the climate information that we're doing here at the academy. It's perhaps a repository about the all the consensus studies on climate change that have been There was a request for some sort of repository of all our publicly available information. Thanks, Charles. Apologies for the, the audio online. Laura, do you want to go next and report back on the online section? Sure, I'm happy to go next. And we had the benefit of our speaker. So there were 10 people who asked questions and we had a fascinating discussion about a number of things. I'll just mention some of the things that caught this group's fancy. Uh, we, we talked a lot about um, how consent could be maintained over the life cycle of a mine where things kind of start 20 years before a mine actually opens um, and the challenges with that. Uh, we talked a lot about the, the issue of the United States re-domesticating mining so that we don't keep outsourcing our demand for these minerals to places where they don't have uh, the same process for gaining community consent. Um, Jessica did note that the scenarios that she showed for 2050 cannot be met only with American mines, um, but this is something that, that we could consider. Uh, we asked a little bit about her slide that showed the smart mines of the future and whether there are any mines in the world that look like this, and apparently there are some examples in Western Australia for people who might want them. Um, uh, Jessica also talked about the intriguing idea that you know, the mining industry is thinking about how to use this transition to clean energy to kind of reset themselves with the public since they have traditionally not had um, a very good public profile. Um, she seemed skeptical that this uh, was something that, that was going to be highly successful, but, but said that you know it's something that we need to think about. Um, and then a final issue that we talked about was, you know, how do you respond to people who say that electrification is actually going to cause more problems than global warming? Um, and she mentioned, you know, this has been a highly politicized issue, uh, but that probably the core of it is that there's a real disconnect between the users of energy, which I guess is all of us, and the people who are involved in resource extraction, um, and that maybe bridging that gap would be useful. Um, we did not really have a chance to discuss as a group the questions that were put in the Slido, but I do think that all the virtual participants voted in the Slido and we'll be collecting the Jamboard responses uh, for use later. I also want to mention that there are a number of important resources that were dumped onto the chat, and I hope those can get captured for anybody in the room that might like additional resources on any of these topics. Thank you, Laura, that was great. Okay, uh, one last uh, report up from Miles. Um, Investment. We had a fantastic discussion. Uh, we didn't find many of the results uh, that surprising just because they were so close together, but uh, there was a good deal of things missing uh, that we felt uh, from uh, the, the list of options. A big one was enforcement, uh, enforcement on companies uh, that are not uh, 